Welcome to Money Conversations with KJ. KJ is a lifelong entrepreneur who's made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, and found his way back again. If you're looking for a sterile how-to, you're in the wrong place. KJ and his guests will walk you through real-life situations told by the people who live them, and they are as messy as they are inspiring. Each episode will offer lessons learned, advice on how to replicate successes and avoid pitfalls, and a new perspective to power your financial literacy. Far from a one-size-fits-all, this podcast can help you build a roadmap to your personal promised land. Milk and honey for some, whiskey and steak for others, and remind you that you're not alone on this journey hello hello welcome back welcome back to the show i'm kj your host um we've got here mr mike defriends as a guest today good friend of mine i've known i don't know mike what do you think six years five years i think it's been about six years yeah 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 well welcome to the show thank you glad to be here thank you for having me great i just you know we're gonna get into this and i know part of your story i don't know all of your story so i i really looking forward to hear you know what you're going to share with not just me but the audience out there and, and we're, we're, we're going to be able to uh, teach some people some lessons hopefully cool so um Let's talk to the folks. Basically, I know one, you're an entrepreneur, right? You don't yeah. you don't trade time for money. You trade value for money. But um, let's start even further back. Let's talk to the people about as far back as you can remember yeah. with with money as a as a child. What can you remember about money? Well, um, I grew up in the suburb of Chicago. Uh, my father is originally from a rural part of Italy. Um, was born in the late 30s and his family always, you know, kind of just tried to make ends meet. His father was a farmer. Um, you know, you hear the stories about him having to walk to school barefoot carrying his shoes because he didn't want to wear out the soles. Um, and, and so when he came to the United States, you know, he came here because he said, you know, this is the land of opportunity. And I think a lot of us that are born here um, maybe sometimes take that for granted because we might not have ever experienced anything other than that. Um, but he was able to come here and work really hard um, and, you know, saved, a, saved as much money as he could until he was able to, to start his own business. Um, and he thought, you know, that that was the American dream and the way to financial freedom. Um, and his goals were just to start a family and provide a really good quality of life and then have a legacy, something that he could pass on to his kids. And my mom was born here in America. Um, and, you know, I can completely understand where my father's coming from as a father myself, um, you know, wanting to provide a better life for my kids and, you know, create a legacy, uh, not just financially, but educationally as well, so that we can, you know, teach our, our children, um, you know, some of these principles of uh, financial literacy that they can carry with them throughout their lifetime. Um, and that's why it's always been really important for me to educate myself because growing up in that family, yes, you know, my father knew how to work really, really hard, um, but he traded all that time uh, as when we were children for money. And sadly, um, you know, he was able to make ends meet, but he never really got to experience that financial freedom that he was always looking for. And, you know, when I became an adult, a young adult, he always said to me, he goes, Mikey, you know, don't make the same mistakes I did. Um, and what he meant by that was, you know, he missed out on a tremendous amount of our childhood. Um, mm -hmm. But the intention was, you know, good things, of course, right, to have a better life for us. And then obviously to have something, you know, that he could potentially pass on. Um, so, you know, I was raised with the, the mindset of, you know, kind of scarcity where, you know, typical things, money doesn't grow on trees. Um, you know, my family never had a ton of expendable income, you know, to, so I remember as a kid, um, you know, wanting certain things that maybe other friends, uh, had or were, were given. Um, but you know, that inspired me and it motivated me, um, and it motivated me to, uh, take a lot of the, um, foundational lessons, you know, of hard work, um, that my father instilled upon me, but also though, start looking at different ways where, um, I could have a different outcome, you know, because I knew someday when I had a family, I didn't want to have uh, the same kind of lifestyle 
that my father had with in relationship that my father had with his kids. So essentially, I mean, and again, we all watch our parents do what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we all really get. This is, I mean, through the conversations I'm having, there's a very good commonality thing going on here, right? We subconsciously, we watch our parents, what they do. So you watched your dad be a hardworking individual Mm -hmm. and take care of the family. Yeah. Um, which is what all parents, you know, want to do, but never really got the chance to get really ahead Mm -hmm. and enjoy some, uh, some great things that life has to offer. So share with us, what do you think is kind of your first lesson with money? Did your dad teach you? Did somebody else teach you your lessons with money? Because Mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of money when you were young, right? right? Your parents were just, you know, said, just getting by and, you know, making sure there's food on the table, something roof over your head, that kind of thing. But at what age did you kind of figure money was something that you could use um, besides just trading time for it? Well, you know, I've heard when I was growing up, um, you know, money doesn't buy happiness. Right. And but what I also learned is, you know, money can buy you some freedom um, and it can buy you some peace of mind. Uh, which uh, I think are, you know, obviously very critical, like in, in life. Um, so, you know, when, when I was younger regarding, you know, the way I looked at, at money, um, you know, I was always looking for opportunities as a young kid, uh, to earn money or to make money because I, I didn't have the opportunity to get certain things that I I wanted. If I wanted a BMX bike, I had to earn it. You know, if I wanted, um, a video game system, which, you know, I had to earn it. Um, and so, and I'm really glad that, that I, I had to be in that position at the time. I can still recall that, um, I I didn't, you know, I wish I was, I had it like other kids. Um, but it really taught me to, to value things, you know, because I realized how much time I had to put in to get something. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that's something that I think as generations go on now, they they may not have that same perspective. So did you actually have, again, any money lessons per se from mom or dad? Did they sit you down and mm-hmm. talk about money, how to use money, don't squander money? Yeah. Obviously, they worked. They, I'm, you, you learned a work ethic. Mm-hmm. That's clear. I'm just trying to get to there's going to be people out there that are maybe in their early 20s or maybe they're in their mid 20s, have kids, not really sure how to start to mold them because I know you do have kids. Yeah. So my follow up question is going to be with your kids. Are you doing anything specific teaching them about money? Absolutely. Because like, you know, when I was a kid, you know, my parents, because of their lack of financial literacy, you know, they didn't have retirement accounts. They didn't have 401ks. They didn't have IRAs. They didn't have, uh, they never set a budget, you know, they just, um, and, and, you know, I, I would imagine if they had someone or they took the time to educate themselves on these different things that they probably would have made decisions differently. Um, you know, when it comes to my kids, um, you know, I'm a big believer in educating them on working smarter, not harder. Um, and I know, you know, everyone who's listening has probably heard that before. Um, you know, I also heard a quote once where I think it was some billionaire who said, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, and so there is an element of hard work that has to be dedicated or, or, or put in, you know, um, but we all have the same amount of time in a week and a month and a year. And I think it's how we decide to utilize that time. You know, um, like my son, who's 12 years old, you know, instead of, you know, playing video games with his buddies, you know, he's setting up an eBay store where he uh, is literally asking us, you know, do you guys want this still? If not, like he'll put it online. He'll knock on the neighbor's doors and say, hey, guys, is there anything you want to sell and how much do you want for it? And then he, he gets to keep the difference on it. You know, and he's looking at he's already asking questions about, uh, you know, stocks and and stocks that pay dividends. Um, And these are things that are very interesting to him. You know, so I'm the money lessons I'm teaching them is um, number one to hopefully become entrepreneurs uh, because you can work for somebody your whole life. And I know people that make multiple six figure incomes that are W2 employees. And they still never get to experience what a lot of people would consider financial freedom. They may live comfortably, 
but they never get to experience that that financial freedom or that time freedom for that matter. Um, so, you know, I'd like to think my my son who's 12 and my daughter who's 14 are, are growing up with the intention of knowing that whatever field they decide to get into, that they can they can start a business. Um, and I've also been a huge believer and I've seen this in, in my in my personal life that it doesn't matter what industry you get into. You know, I think a lot of people associate wealth with, you know, um, a financial sector or, you know, um, a technology sector. It, it, I, I've seen family members who have very little education, you know, um, in terms of, you know, uh, formal education, I guess, um, that have gone on to to build multi-million dollar companies, you know, um, in in areas that you probably would never imagine. Um so I'm a big believer that no matter what industry you choose, there's always going to be opportunities to establish, grow, scale a, a business that can create that time and financial freedom. I agree. I think there's a lot of parents out there. If you're the W-2 family, your kids are most likely going to be W-2 kids, right? If your family, your parents, one or the other is an entrepreneur and, and you know, and I'm a lifelong entrepreneur, you I think we want that for our kids because we realize that time freedom is more valuable than the money itself. Mm -hmm. At least it is for me. It's funny. We just made a joke because I just made a tea time for Monday morning. <laughs> and most people go do what Monday morning? They go to yeah. their J-O-Bs, right? So, I mean, that's just the flexibility that I afford myself. That doesn't mean that you guys don't know that I work on Sundays and Saturdays, right? So uh, that, that's just the life of an entrepreneur. You know, you can do 27 days straight and then take two days off. It's yeah. just, it's a different life and it's not for everyone for sure. Um, and with that said, Kevin, I want to bring up a quick point because uh, I think a lot of your listeners, um, and this was me years ago, um, where, you know, if you, if you are raised in a family that uh, we'll use the term W2, you know, where they're an employee of, of a business, um, you're right. I mean, chances are that, that the parents or whoever's raising them will, you know, teach their kids, you know, go to school. When I was, when I was 18, my dad said, go to school, become a doctor or a lawyer. Why? Um, because you're going to be fine in life, you know? Um, but it only takes one person uh, in your family to, to change that generational path. And what I mean by that is, you know, I can look at all of my immediate family, all of my extended family. And, you know, if everybody has the same belief system, okay, that doesn't mean I have to. And for the people that are listening, it's the same with you as well. You know, just because it only takes that one person to change their mindset um, and, you know, to look at other people or to read, you know, books that were written by other people that have the results that they're looking for. Um, because you, once you start reading enough books or listening to enough podcasts, um, you know, you start to notice patterns. Um, you start to notice patterns of the way people think, the way people act, um, not just with their time, but also with their money as well. Agreed. Agreed. There's, you know, I think a lot of kids and I always use the term kids cause I'm getting so freaking <laughs> old here, but, um, you know, in their 20s or whatever, and they're trying to figure it out, right? And mom and dad want them to go be X, Y, Z, the doctor, the attorney. And, and you and I both know, I know plenty of doctors and attorneys that don't have no money. So <laughs> it's not a, it's not the the, the uh, all path for everyone. So it's just what, like you said, it's just whatever path you decide. You've got to give it your all. I like to call things front end loaded. Most things are very front end loaded. I mean, you got to put a lot of work in the beginning. Yeah. And then you'll see the fruits of your labor come in later. And if you choose a path that some fruits are bigger than others. Right. Um, and Kevin, and it, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, I mean, this conversation that we're having doesn't have to be geared towards the 20 year olds either. I mean, no. this, I think, you know, what we're talking about here today, um, is just geared towards anybody who's sick and tired of being sick and tired of, you know, doing the same thing, you know, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, and having the same result. Um, you know, it's, it's never too early. I don't believe, and it's never too late, you know, to do something to make a change. Uh, and change is always uncomfortable, always. And I'm a big believer that the only reason that people are reluctant to make any kinds of changes, whether it's personally or professionally is fear-based. 
And, you know, uh, I read once or heard once uh, or multiple times that fear is an acronym for false evidence appearing real. And what I mean by that is in your mind, you paint this picture um, and there's there's a, a great book I read um, that talks about um, the fear of failure and how to overcome that. And I think that's the number one thing, because people are always worried when they're you know, you can interview a thousand people and they will all probably tell you, I've always dreamed of doing this. I've always wanted to do this. This has always been my passion, my dream. And you ask them, why don't you do that? And they say, oh, I don't have the time or I don't have the money or, you know, but I don't, I don't think those are real reasons. I think everybody can find the time. They can, uh, they can raise money. Okay. If they knew how to do it. Right. Right. And understanding that, you know, when you, you start to make these changes and you start to think differently, um, you start noticing again that entrepreneurs, they understand that the path to success is, is not a smooth paved flat road. I mean, it's full of hills, peaks, valleys, um, you know, but if you understand that going into it, um, then I think you're going to be a lot stronger mentally and be a lot more prepared. Well, I think there's two words that, that really stick out really large for me for what you were just explaining there, which one is belief, the belief system and two fear, mm -hmm. right? Because when people believe whatever it is you believe in, it's, it can be very difficult for people to change their belief system. So, I mean, you Absolutely. could just take religion for instance, right? Once you decide to become whatever religion that you're believing in, you're not going to let it go. And that's fine. And there's no right or wrong here, mm -hmm. everybody. It's just belief systems are very hard to break. And then fear, right? Mm -hmm. Fear of unknown. It's just getting comfortable being uncomfortable is, is what you got to get to. But I try to teach my kids failure is a good thing mm -hmm. because failures are learning stepping stones. Right. And you can't learn without failures, really. Uh, you can try to learn through other people's failures, mm -hmm. which if I've, I was a, personally, that's what I've tried to do my whole life. But we all still have failures. Right. And you've got to learn from them. Absolutely. Sort of to have a belief system. If you're raised in, in a type of family that says, don't step out of your comfort zone, stay in your lane kind of thing. Yeah. That could hold you back. You could be someone that um, just has some sort of belief since you were a little kid that you wanted to do. But everybody's told you not to do it. Absolutely. And, you know, um, again, just referencing back to to things I've heard and I've read, and I'll say that a lot throughout this this podcast, but, um, you know, like technology companies, you know, I, I lived 17 years in the San Francisco Bay Area and knowing a lot of people in technology, when somebody is launching a startup and it doesn't have to be technology, it can be any new startup company in any industry, um, they expect failure. They, they know it. So, for example, if you're building a software platform, it's not going to be perfect day one. They know that they're, they're going to need to adjust it and, and make you know, modifications and, and recode it and things like that. And something that a lot of entrepreneurs realize is that when you have those, those failures, whether they're small or some can be significant, okay, and when you have those, you have two choices. You know, you can either allow those failures to paralyze you mentally, okay, where you don't want to go forward because the fear kicks in, you know, or you can allow those failures, whether they're small or large, to mobilize you. And what I mean by that is look at that situation and say, okay, this is, this is what we have, you know, and some entrepreneurs, you know, plan certain failures, right? They say, okay, well, you know, when we launch this business, these are the things that potentially could happen or could go wrong. And then, you know, one, if they do happen, how do we overcome those? And so by taking themselves through this mental planning and sometimes in their business plans, they'll, they'll put the, you know, they'll, they'll even put, uh, you know, it's called a SWOT out, a SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And when they see, when they identify threats before, you know, they even start their business, then if it comes up, it's really not as big of a deal as it might have been to somebody who didn't plan for that or who didn't maybe forecast that. I think we can take those business um, that you describe parallels in, in life, right? And just as you're going through life, and again, I don't care, 20, 30, 50, whatever, however old you are, you know, if things haven't been working out. Don't just keep pounding your head against the same deal. It's okay to change. It's okay to fail. It's okay to start again. Mm -hmm. And I really think in today's world, this is 2020 technology is 
unbelievable. <laughs> um, the, the opportunities that the kids have today compared to when you or I are in our twenties or times a hundred, uh, <laughs> man, I saw a kid on YouTube the other day, 22 years old, making 300 grand a month because he's a good artist. Right. <laughs> but mainly because they started following him on YouTube, he's got 30 million followers. Right. Yeah. And capitalizing on how YouTube works. That's just, you know, amazing, but he spends everything he makes. He, f he blatantly will tell you, I spend it. <laughs> I spend it all. I don't save anything. Wow. I don't invest. I spend, I make 300 grand. I'm, I spent 400 because wow. I know, you know, this, so nobody's taught this guy yet, yeah. you know, anything about money and like, Hey, this, this may not last forever. You probably should put some away. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, we both have kids, mine are, mine are grown and gone. You're still in the middle of raising. So you know, I, I know that I've learned that they look and they watch us and being an entrepreneur is, is an awesome thing. But again, it's not for everyone, but I think it's can set a, a mindset of tradition. Mm -hmm. Like I'm supposed to be the entrepreneur or I'm supposed to be a W2 earner. And, and again, two different paths, neither one's right or wrong. It's just mm -hmm. what your path may be. What do you think is, is more motivating to, to people money wise what why does money motivate people to do things that's a good question i mean and i think it's different for everybody <clears throat> you know some people are motivated by material uh possessions um i think for for me that was a motivator early on in my career because i didn't really have material <laughs> possessions growing up and i thought those things would make me happy until i started to acquire them and then realize they don't okay um, I think some people are motivated by money for their ego, you know, where they want to be recognized by their peers, by their family um, as, quote, being successful. Um, and then I think other people, money motivates them, um, you know, to build a legacy, create a legacy and have a legacy that they and not just necessarily to leave their kids or grandkids or nieces, and nephews when they're gone, but also from a philanthropic standpoint, you know, people being able to give back to organizations that uh, are very dear to them. You know, um, a lot of people have, uh, I've talked to thousands of people in my life, in my career, and I've asked a lot of people, if you had more time and more money, what would you do to give back? And you know what? You always see people look off a little bit because they're, they're recalling something that's very personal to them. And everybody has something that is, you know, that they would love to do more for. Um, and so, you know, and then, you know, for other people, um, I think they're motivated by money for that time freedom. You know, they want to spend more time with their friends. They want to spend more time with their loved ones. They want to spend more time volunteering, uh, and they want to spend more time seeing this beautiful world. That's an interesting, um, look at it. I, I kind of look at it another a way that I, that people can look, it, look at money. Money is a tool, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, money, all it does for me is give me options. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. What are my options depending the amount of money I want or, or if there's a goal that I need to achieve and it's going to take dollar X, that's just another option. I like to, if I keep it that mindset of money, mm -hmm. then it's not a five or a 20 or a hundred dollar bill or a thousand bucks. It's just something I'm striving for. And I don't get emotionally caught up in it. Right. It's just a tool. Right. Which for me works well. That's why, <laughs> that's why I golf so much. But, um, but we, we have to use that tool and leverage that tool for investing. Let's go down the road of investing. Absolutely. I love to. your kids are young. Have yeah. you talked to them about investing? Absolutely. Um, why, did, why did you talk to them and how old were they? I'll give you an example. And I've been talking to them about this as far as I can remember, literally, because I don't think there's, it's, I don't think there's such thing as too young. I agree. Also, you know, contrary to what a lot of people might think or believe, um, I grew up in an environment where we don't talk about money. We don't talk about what we make. We don't talk about what we invest in. We don't talk about any of that. Why is that? There's a, there, there's a, there, there's a lot of people that are like that. Mm -hmm. It's, it can be a very taboo yeah. uh, conversation with people. Yeah. Like, why are you invading in my privacy? Yeah. It's almost, sometimes I, I compare it to like, we don't talk about <laughs> sex and we don't talk about money. Right. Back up. Don't talk to well, me about that stuff. And I think with our kids, we need to be talking about both of those things yeah. because they're very important things in our lives. But, Absolutely. Uh, well, for, I think for some people like myself included, you know, sometimes I don't like to talk about money with certain friends or family because i know they're just gonna hit me up for some 
um, no, I'm, I'm joking, but yeah. I, I don't, I'm not sure why I, maybe, you know, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, that's, I think that's something that's maybe changing because, you know, with the, uh, advancement of technology and things, I think, um, you know, I think people are just being overall more transparent, you know, with each other and with their lives. And if you're genuinely serious about making any kind of change, I don't care what it is, um, whether it's your health, your wellness, your finances, your career, the more transparent and open you can be, it gives someone a better opportunity to help you. I can't help you if I don't know what your situation looks like. And so, you know, when it comes to my kids, yes, I've been absolutely teaching them, you know, to uh, uh, different principles around money, around finance. Uh, um, I'm a huge advocate of getting kids, if they can earn money, uh, whether it's through your business or on their own, and they can set up, uh, for example, a, uh, um, a Roth IRA, which um, I believe the contributions have gone up to 6,500 a year, but that's an after-tax contribution. Um, but the beauty of that is that there's something called the compound effect in the rule of 72. And, you know, I, I, I don't know what the actual number is, but I would guess that most people don't start planning for their retirement until they're in their 30s or maybe even late 30s, 40s, uh, and maybe some even later. And if you look at, and just for simple math, you know, like, for example, um, the rule of 72. I don't, I'm not sure if you discuss that. On, I do. I okay. do. I teach that very well. It's it's an amazing um, rule. It's compound interest and truly understanding compound interest, which is yeah. based on time, right? And right. we are all only on this planet for a, a certain amount of time. Right. And the sooner, if you can get your child at five years old to open a Roth IRA, I don't care if that child's only contributing two or 400 bucks a year, just minimum amounts. Right. The contribution is in 2020 up to 7,000 a year. Oh, wow. Um, until you hit 50 and then the, then they allow you another thousand bucks. So yeah, the sooner that you can, the better, because I, I'll teach it again real quick. It's just on time. It's just, they call it the rule of 72 because depending on the percentage uh, that you're either paying out or you're, or you're earning, like if you put your money in your bank and if let's just say, for example, the bank was giving you 1% on your money in your savings account, which we all know they don't, <laughs> um, it would take 72 years to double your money. So if you right. stuck 10,000 bucks in there, it's 72 years to go to 20,000. Well, right. that's obviously a lifetime, 72 yeah. years. So the object of the game is I need to earn more than 1% on my money. Right. Right. And so if you take the 72 um, and you know, you divide that by the rate of return, mm -hmm. right. And let's say you, you could find investments, let's say 7%. Okay. Then that means it's going to take your money 10 years to double. Right. Right. So 72 divided by seven would be 7.2 or, or sorry, 10.2, uh, I think. Yep. Um, and then if you could bump that up to 10%, now you're looking at seven years, right? As opposed to 10. So 1%, your money is doubling every 72 years. Um, you know, 7% is doubling every 10 years. 10% is doubling every seven years. And, you know, when, when you look at a, a young person who, let's say at the age, you know, my kid started when he was 10, right? Um, and if he's, he's earning minimum 10% returns on his money. Um, so by the time he's 17, his money's gonna double. Yes. Okay. And then you fast forward seven more years. So by the time he's uh, 24, um, you know, he's going to have uh, his money's going to double again. All right. By the time he's 31, it's going to double again <clears throat> versus you get somebody who starts at the age of 31. And when you do the math on the, that compound effect, it, it's massive. It's, it's really massive. It's, it, it, it's, I'll give you an example. I, you yeah. want me to give you an example? Sure, I'd love to. So there's an example out there that shows if you open up a Roth IRA at the age of 20 mm -hmm. and you max it out. Right. At six, this was at six. The example is at six thousand a year and you max it out for seven years and you're 27 years old and then you never put another dime in there. And so that's forty two thousand dollars that you've contributed. Yeah. By the time you're 62 years old, you'll have one point seven million dollars. <laughs> OK, now, <laughs> how much did you, they contribute the, the maximum year per right. year? No, but I'm saying oh, so 42,000. Yeah, 42,000 gets me 1.2. 1. 1. Right. It's crazy. So, it's crazy. Right. Yeah. Now, if you this is the value of time, if you wait until you're 30 years old to make the decision, hey, I'm going to go open up a Roth IRA. Yeah. You would have to max out your Roth IRA from age 30 to 62 to have one million dollars. <laughs> Wow. Like you have less money. Yeah. This is the value of time. So if your child started at five, 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And obviously at five, unless you've got some wealthy parents, that are going to help you out. Mm-hmm. Um, it'd be really difficult to max out. You know, you're right there. Well, and it has, yeah. And it has to be earned income as well. Yeah, right? earned income. So, um, so, but that's okay. You're an entrepreneur. You pay your kids. Right. But I mean, if I would have known that, I mean, my, my first job I got when I was 10 years old now it was, you know, it was my uncle's restaurant busing tables. But if I would have understood these things, like, you know, my idea of saving money as a 10 year old was putting it in a, in a shoebox or a piggy bank. Exactly. You know, I didn't know anything about earning interest. You know, I didn't know anything about a return on my investment or a return on my money. Um, and so that's why I'm saying, I, you know, I, I think there's no such thing as starting them too young um, to, to think different. Um you know, uh, and, and, and also to, to start educating them on, you know, I, I give you an example, you know, my daughter joked about when she turned 16 about buying her this, you know, really fancy car, right. It was over a hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, and she goes, ha ha, I'm just kidding, dad. She goes, I would never buy that. You know, and I said, why? And she goes, cause it's a waste of money. She goes, it's a depreciating asset. Ah, she gets so, it. But I said to her, I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with rewarding yourself if you want something nice. And I said, but instead of, you know, spending a hundred thousand dollars, let's say you cash on a car, which obviously you wouldn't do. But I said, what if you took that hundred thousand dollars and you invested it and you were earning 12% a year on your money. And now you're getting $12,000 a year, a thousand dollars a month. And you took that thousand dollars and you made that car payment. I said, that car payment will be gone after five years. If you maxed out the term on it, and I said, but you would still have that hundred thousand dollars invested in something that was producing a thousand dollars a month, right? Versus having an asset, or, or sorry, a, a liability in the form of vehicle that is a depreciating asset, right? Um, it's it's the exact lesson I taught my daughter, my youngest one, yeah. who bought her first condo in February. Oh, and thanks. Yeah. And she, we had that exact conversation where. When she turned 16 and she wanted me to get her a new car, I said, that's not happening. Uh, she, I said, you know, it, it's, your, your mom deserves a new car. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to buy your mother a new car because she deserves it. You get mom's car, right? And she, at 16, whatever, give me a set of wheels, right? Yeah. So I remember when she, uh, so she goes to work and she's earning money. And uh, she, she, she toyed with buying a car when she, she had about, I don't know, eight or 9,000 bucks saved up. Mm-hmm. And I taught her that lesson. I said, no, let's buy you a condo. You'll live in it for the next three, maybe five at the most, because the, the goal is to get her a single family home mm-hmm. in the next four years. I said, and now you're going to have this asset condo that you're going to turn into a rental yeah. in exactly that conversation. That's an appreciating asset. You're going to take the cash flow from that condo, which won't be a lot. It's going to be about 300 bucks a month. Right. But you're then you're going to go buy yourself an automobile, which is a depreciating asset, but your appreciating asset will pay for your depreciating asset. That car essentially didn't cost you anything. But how much did she put down on the condo? Um, Oh, that was the beauty of it. Right. So she had the money, but first time home buyers Mm -hmm. have, they have first time home buyer assistance programs. So she ended up only having to pay closing costs, no down payment. Which was what? A couple grand? 2,500 bucks. Yeah. So see a lot of people when you, you know, you mentioned like cash flow, right? Mm-hmm. And you said it's not going to cash flow a lot, 300 bucks a month, but that's $3,600 a year. Exactly. And when you compare that, and this is the way investors look at opportunities is what am I putting in and what am I getting out? Right? So if she's putting in $2,500 one time, but she, yet she's earning, even if she moved out of it right now and she was earning that $300 a month in one year she's going to uh, receive what 150% return on her money. Yeah. You know, a hundred percent of return would have been getting that 2,500 back. But if she's earning 3,600, that's close to 150% in in the first year. In the first year. Yeah, exactly. But the lesson taught was, no, we're not going to go waste money on a new car. Yeah. Because we know most kids today, whether they're earning it or a parent gives them to me, it's, it's not a good lesson for the child. It's just not a good lesson. And, and unfortunately, you know, everybody will play Monday morning quarterback, 2020 hindsight. You know, you get to the age of 40, whatever, looking back going, why did I do that? What was I thinking? What was yeah. I thinking doing that? Right. I mean, the only to me, the only benefit of, you know, getting my, one of my children a, a vehicle is I'm also a big believer in establishing credit. Right. You know, and for example, like when my daughter turned 14, I added her to my credit card accounts as an authorized user. 
so that she could start having credit reported uh, or, you know, uh, on her credit report positively so that by the time she's 18, she'll have this four year established history. Um, and, you know, part of building credit is, is having, you know, open accounts and access to capital and credit and things like that. So yeah. I think there could be some good lessons taught and, and learned. There can be. And that's you know, one route leveraging. to go. If, if you have a family that is able to do that, you mm-hmm. know, I, I actually had my daughter on the podcast last week and we talked <laughs> about that lesson. I was very specific with um, I wanted her to build her own credit. I did not want to put her on mine. Mm. It doesn't take that long, you know, but yeah. when you're 18, you've never really worked because you're not old enough to work uh, some side jobs, low cash flow money or whatever. But to actually uh, be a W-2 earner, um, I showed her how to structure herself to build her credit in a very short amount of time. Great. So by the time she had two full years of employment, which is what you need to buy a home. Yeah. Um, she had built her credit from zero to seven fifty. It's awesome. So right. when she bought that place, I know a lot of people think I helped her buy it. I signed, <laughs> I gave her money. I said, no, no, no. Our plan was from when she was 15, I already laid wow. it out. I go, no, this is, this is the roadmap. This is how we're going to get this done. And you're going to do it a hundred percent on your own, because if you do it a hundred percent on your own, you're going to be a lot more proud of yourself. You're Absolutely. going to take care of that condo because you worked your butt off to get to it rather than if dad helped you. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's just how kids are today. Right. Um, and, that, but, you know, th- and that's a good point. We we're discussing here is, you know, the idea of credit, because, you know, that's a huge, huge thing. When I was growing up, you know, is don't don't have debt, you know, don't don't take don't get credit cards. Um you know, I, I remember asking, you know, friends and family, I'm like, why, what's wrong with the credit card? And they're like, oh, it gets you in trouble. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it gets you in debt, you know, and we've no, had they, that can great, yeah. they can be a great tool if you're educated and you're responsible. Um, and in that can a lot, some people use them to start businesses. You know, I, I think out there, there's probably going to be some listeners out there that have probably listened to someone um, like a Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman, <laughs> which are extremely dead adverse. Dave Ramsey's like, do not get a credit card. If you have yeah. them, hurry up and chop them up and throw them away. Right. He believes in no credit whatsoever. Well, yeah. on that note, real quick, because I had this conversation with with somebody who was a huge advocate of both of them. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, when you look at the United States, there's probably five percent. I think I read that somewhere of people become entrepreneurs, right? The other 95% are consumers, W2 and employees. Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman are probably great for that 95%. Yes. That, that are, are quite comfortable. There's nothing wrong with this. I have a lot of family and friends in this situation where they're quite comfortable, you know, doing their, going to their job week in, week out, year in, year out. And that, and, and, you know, if they, if, if they don't have financial education or literacy or understanding of, of credit and things like that, then yeah, they probably should listen to them. But if you are serious about becoming an entrepreneur, you have to change that mindset 100%. And that's why I say that for 95% of the people out there that are, you know, the consumer mindset, that's, that's fine. Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman are probably great for that. They'll keep you quote safe. Um, but for the other 5% that want, you know, more in terms of, um, and I'm not just talking about financially, but, you know, more in terms of their time and, and, um, you know, they have to get used to that. They have to get used to accessing credit, leveraging credit and being open to that because otherwise they're always going to have challenges, you know, when it comes to growing a business. I agree. I, I think we all have to learn whether you're an entrepreneur or a W2, right? The, the use the key word there, which is called, which is leverage, right? Mm-hmm. And we can leverage, not just money. We can leverage time. We can leverage people Absolutely. to get where, what we want, you know, whether it be, you know, more money, possessions, time, um, and it's okay to leverage, right? As long as we're leveraging responsibly. Well, I think one of the best things you could leverage is other people's experiences, that's what this podcast is all about. I want all you guys to learn <laughs> yeah. because let's share with the audience, if you don't mind. Sure. Give us give us a, one of your life lessons where you had a <laughs> loss or a failure. And then after the fact, whether it be 12 months, 10 years later, you look yeah. back and said, man, that was a really tough learning lesson. Oh, God, I can go on for hours about those. <laughs> but, you know, there, there's an obvious one that comes to mind. 
um, that I think impacted a lot of people um, was, you know, uh, 10, 12 years ago during the the housing crisis or the housing bur- bubble burst um, uh, and, and the stock market crash. Um, you know, I remember back in 2005, six, you know, um, that's when I, I started uh, my first business in 2005. And uh, I was always a big believer in, in working independent as an independent contractor because I wanted to have a career that didn't dictate my value in terms of money. Um, and, you know, I remember earning what a lot of people at the age of 25, 26 would have considered a, gr- a good income. And I wasn't happy with it. And it's not that I wanted more possessions, but I wanted to be able to do more in terms of I wanted to invest. I wanted to help my family. I wanted to uh, just to have more options. Right. And uh, I remember, you know, my mother, who's a real estate broker, um, and she said to me, you know, Mikey, you're doing really well. You've, you know, you, you always save your money. You should invest in your real estate. And I said, mom, I don't know anything about real estate. And she's like, oh, it's not that hard. She goes, you just put down a down payment. And she goes, uh, they can tell you what the mortgage taxes and insurance are going to be. And if you can rent the place for equal to that, right, um, then that's great because real estate always goes up. You know? <laughs> um, and so that was the extent of my education. And I put a lot of putting aside the fact that she was my mom, put, um, I put a lot of faith and trust in the fact that she must know what she's doing because she's a licensed broker, right? She must have all this education behind her in terms of, you know, the real estate market. And I didn't know anything about real estate, nothing. Um, And that's what I did. I went out and with my savings, I bought uh, myself a primary residence. And then the same year I bought two investment properties. And, um, you know, I had to put a substantial amount of money down because, uh, things were different back then, you know, um, in terms of, uh, you know, down payments on, on investment properties and things like that. And, you know, she was right. I got, I, I was able to rent them out, you know, uh, for about the same as my mortgage and and insurance and taxes. But fast forward five years, you know, what I realized was that the housing market doesn't always go up. Okay. There's cycles and yes, it does go up. Yes, it does go down and sometimes it plateaus, right? And so one of the biggest lessons I learned was, you know, back in 2012, 11, 12. So I bought them in 06 and in 11 and 12, um, I lost them, unfortunately, you know, just um, for various reasons, um, you know, circumstantial reasons. But what I realized was that I had put down $100,000 on these two assets that literally made me no money. Now, there were some tax benefits, I'll give you that. And when I actually talked to a professional real estate investor in 2012, literally in probably a 30 minute conversation with that individual, I would have never bought those properties because he was a professional and he had been doing it for years and he had hundreds of transactions behind him as an investor. Um, And he said, Mike, you know, if you're putting $100,000 down on these two different properties, maybe it was 75, something like that. He said, what you have to look at is what are you, what do you, what's the return a year? Because if they're cash flowing and there's a return, and, even, and returns are, are, you know, there's, they're, um, everyone's interpretation of what a good return in is different, you know, so, right. you know, to, to somebody who is accustomed to saving their money under their mattress, half a percent is probably good. Um, you know, but for a lot of uh, people that um, are educated around different investment strategies, you know, they're looking for 10, 12, 14, 15 percent types of return. And so that was a massive, massive lesson, you know, that cost me a lot of money. Um, and it cost you something more than money, though. Right. Because we can always make money back. Yeah. Guys like you and me, we're going to make that back. It was a great learning experience. You lost time. Mm-hmm. You know, so it sounds like the learning lesson for everybody that's out there. I mean, we have to do our homework, yeah. plain and simple. Don't trust. And in this case, it sounds horrible. You can't <laughs> even trust your mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? you know, I think I mentioned this earlier. If, if you, you know, if no matter what you want personally or professionally, financially, you have to look at the type of people that have it because everybody's going to give you quote advice. Right. Everybody, you know, your neighbor will give you advice. Your your everybody. Like if you ask for it or if you mention it. And I think maybe that's why people were so 
uh, private about money for a long time because they didn't want people saying, well, this is what you should do with it. This is what you should do with it. You know, it's, right. it's great, right, to have options, but it's also critical, you know, that uh, you educate yourself um, and you look at people who um, have, have, you know, the, have had the experience in, in the areas. In this case, my mom was never an investor. She never bought rental properties. She was a real estate broker. She was looking to make a commission. <laughs> so that's cool. That's what agents do. Listen, yeah. I'm an agent with my wife, among other things that I do, but it's a great lesson. I think the lesson there is number one, do your homework, right? Mm -hmm. um, your homework was with your mom and obviously you're going to trust mom. Mom, I'm sure didn't steer you wrong on purpose. Yeah. It was just her belief yeah. of what she was sharing with you was correct. Um, and at that point in time in 06 and people were buying houses like they were hot dogs, right? Yeah. Just hurry up and get one. There's plenty to go. Well, and another great example of, you know, less money lessons is, you know, I invest in stock market. And I put my money with a company that people would think is a no brainer, Apple. Right. And, um, you know, I had this, uh, I got to ride this wave, which is still going, you know, of their stock price going up, 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 up. Um, but, you know, like I said, certain things occur that if you're not educated, right? Like, for example, one quarter, um, their earnings report came out. And even though it was incredible, it wasn't what the street expected. And so the stock price drops. And as an uneducated investor, right, um, day trader, you know, I panicked and I sold this stuff and I took a big hit on it. And somebody mm -hmm. told me, they said, well, why didn't you just put a stop loss on the stock, on the trade? I use an online platform and I go, what's that? What is that? <laughs> and literally in like not even five minutes, he's like, well, that, you know, you could put a, uh, you could put it as a percentage or a dollar amount. But if the stock drops below a certain dollar amount or a percentage below where it's at at the moment, it triggers an automatic sell. And I was like, are you kidding me? I go, how do you do that? He goes, dude, it's like $12.99 on E-Trade. And uh, if you just plug it in. And I go, that could literally, that could have saved me $30,000, $40,000. Wow. Just that one piece of information that I didn't know. There you go, people. <laughs> you just learned about stop loss. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. Don't forget it. If you got any money in that stock market and you got a stock, don't. Yeah, the worst. Don't, don't sell your stocks. Let them ride. Let them ride. Stop. Yeah. That type of investing, unless you're a really sophisticated day trader, don't even try to to, to get in that game. It's, it's, it's a very ninety nine percent of people will lose. So, yeah. uh, but a great lesson. Great lesson. Um, let, let's finish up with retirement. Sure. Tell me what your definition of retirement is. You know, I don't know if I'll ever retire. Um, I, 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 I love keeping busy. I love doing things, but I do know that there's going to come a day when, um, you know, I was recently, literally like this past week, uh, talking to a close friend about this and he's like, you know, what do you want to do? Like, what's your long term? And I said, you know what? I've, I've traveled the world, um, you know, 40 something countries, I think. And some of my favorite places to go have been underdeveloped countries. Um, and the first trip I ever did abroad, I was 17 um, and I was in Venezuela of all places. And I'll tell you, I came back with a ridiculous new appreciation and gratitude for the things that I took for granted. Um, and I've continued that in my life um, and I try to do it a few times a year. Obviously, this year is, uh, has been a little bit more challenging, um, but it, it continually reminds me of a lot of things um, that when I've gone to a lot of underdeveloped countries, number one, um, a lot of people don't have the ability to get educated like we do here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've, I've met a lot of people that have dropped out of school when they're teenagers because they go to work to help the family just make ends meet. They, didn't, they never finished high school. They never, you know, were able to go to college or university. Um, and a lot of people, you know, when, when they're forced into these kind of situations or when life deals them these situations, it's, it's very common in, in a lot of countries around the world where because people don't have that ability to just go apply down the street at the restaurant or the coffee shop or whatever, they have to create their own business. They have to, you know, you, you can go to, you know, parts of, 
I mean, I've been to multiple countries in Africa where like, you know, people are selling phone cards on the street, you know, or fruit at the intersections or they're walking down the street selling cigarettes. Um, people create their own jobs. They create their own quote businesses um, because they don't have the opportunity, right, that we have here. Um, and also, uh, I'm very, very passionate about education, you know, and so part of my quote retirement is going to be, um, you know, educating people as much as I can, not just personally, but, you know, I'd love to do some work with, um, you know, starting some schools um, that are going to provide free education in, in underdeveloped countries. Um, so I, you know, my, my vision of retirement is having the, the time freedom and the financial freedom where I don't have to worry about income coming in, um, or I'm sorry, working right for income. I have it passively. And then it's going to allow me to, to do the types of things that I've always been really passionate about. Giving back, giving back. Yeah. So it, you got me thinking there cause you've traveled all these countries, um, underdeveloped countries, America, let's just talk about Americans because that's where we are. That's who we are. <laughs> you know, that word retirement is kind of instilled in us from our first day of work, right? Go work, yeah. go do what you can do so you can have a retirement. And, and you're in countries that that word is probably never even spoken because they know that that's just not even going to be an option. Right. You know, and that saddens my heart that to hear that. But I think a takeaway from maybe some of you that are out there listening is go do that experience, do what you did at 18 or 19 and travel somewhere that's underdeveloped to really, like you said, come back home and have a whole new appreciation Absolutely. for the life you live here. And, and for a lot of folks, I would imagine you probably, you think your life isn't much, but it's extremely way better than the majority of the people on oh, this yeah. planet. Right. Yeah. Um, and then that's why we all want to get back. And, and, and the, in the resources that we have here, you know, it's a lot of people I talk to, <clears throat> um, that are from different countries around the world and not just underdeveloped, but developed countries, you know, the reason why people are attracted to the United States is it's still considered the land of opportunity where you can come in and, and, you know, there's the ability to, you know, and you hear these stories, you know, you hear these stories of people that have immigrated here and, uh, and, and become tremendously successful, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and I think Americans, you know, like overall, you know, we just take for granted a lot of the, the systems that we have set up in this country, but, you know, on the topic of retirement, you know, like, you know, talking to my kids at 12 and 14, like. You know, things like Social Security concern me, you know, whether they're going to be around even for me in 20 years, you know, let alone them in 40, 50 years, um, you know, and I don't know what the statistic is or the number, but I've read somewhere it's it's 100 or 1,000 or 150,000. That's what the average person has saved by the time they retire. Oh, it's less than that. It's way less than that. Okay. Oh, it's like 40% of Americans don't even have a thousand bucks. So oh. it, it, the numbers are really yeah. sad. Um and, well, you know, and, and that's concerning, right? It's I mean, extremely it's, concerning. I, I sometimes I feel like, oh man, how is that fifty whatever per, year old person gonna, you know, who didn't have the education and the, but they were hardworking? You and I have had the opportunity to sit with a lot of people and hear a lot of stories, and that's primarily why I decided to start teaching financial literacy. Is that sat with so many people, good, hardworking Americans, nice people, <laughs> yeah. And they were trying to qualify to purchase something in the realm of twenty to fifty thousand. Then, like, there wasn't even a, a thought about trying to get that money. Right. And they had good jobs, and it was just lack of education of putting their money in certain places early on to be able to have something. And again, not not a. I want to say no fault of their own. They could have been more proactive to learning about financial literacy, but, yeah. but it's not taught in school. So um, as I'm trying to teach financial literacy to the folks out there, I like to call it fifth grade level. We have to start doing the basics that the wealthy know, and it's like tying their shoe. It's no big deal that yeah. the people who don't have money, it's a foreign language. I know people who try to take courses and it's like talking a new, uh, it's another language. They don't even understand yeah. it. So I, I like to try to teach it on a more simpler 
of format that you can really get going. But that's what these conversations are about. So I yeah. think I want to thank you for coming out today Absolutely. and sharing thank those stories you. that, um, you know, that the people can do those nice takeaways from. So very interesting. Travel the world, get a better perspective, come home, be appreciative. Yeah. Make a goal, be responsible with your money. And for God's sakes, teach your kids about money right away. Money should not be taboo. And never stop learning. Never stop learning. Talk about it. Talk about it with your friends. You know, um, yeah, I think we should all do that. That would be really awesome. It's a well, great, great thing what you're doing here, KJ. I appreciate it. Hey, Mike, thanks for coming out, sharing Thank your you stories. Listen. It was really awesome. And you guys for out there, if you got any value of today's uh, podcast here, do me a favor, subscribe to my channel. There's a lot more great stories coming out, real life stories, just like Mike's that um, you guys can get t good takeaways from. So subscribe to my podcast channel. For you guys on YouTube, smash that like button. Please like the, the podcast or the, the show you just saw and subscribe on there also. So remember, I'm going to be releasing a new podcast on YouTube every week on Wednesday. So I want you guys to have a great week. Go talk to somebody about money. Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that episode. I uh, really enjoyed making all these episodes for you. Remember, we're just having uh, conversations with people's journey with money and the things they did right with it, the things they did wrong with it, and uh, how, how did they really come about getting their mindset with money. So uh, every episode is different. We all have a good takeaway from them. So do me a favor. Hit the like button, smash the like button, and subscribe to my channel because every episode that I do is going to be different as all our journeys are different. So you guys take care and uh, we'll talk to you next week.